welcome to La Vida Las Vegas podcast. We're two physical therapists living the life in Las Vegas. I'm Dr. Erica. And I'm Dr. Joe. We created this podcast for two reasons. First, to connect the healthcare, wellness, and fitness communities in Las Vegas. And second, to highlight all the amazing people we've met along the way. Thank you for listening. And remember to take care of yourself. Personal trainer and coach, Landon Picastro Verde, joins us today on La Vida Las Vegas podcast. Born and raised in Vegas, we talk about his competitive weightlifting career, coaching development, and his advice on nutrient timing. He teaches us about poker etiquette and the way to brunch in Vegas. Welcome, Landon, to La Vida Las Vegas podcast. Thank you for coming on. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we really appreciate it. Yeah, I'm excited. So we'll start stuff off first. And why did you choose Las Vegas? Vegas. So I was born and raised right in Las Vegas. A unicorn. Yeah, like one of the OGs, right? They say there's not too many of us, but... So, born and raised in born Vegas. Born and raised, yeah, born and raised. Okay, I never left, let's see. Uh, obviously, elementary school right here, middle school here, high school here. Um, I looked at a few community colleges, California, for some weird reason, Wyoming. I thought it was like into the cold, right, awkward. Um, but I just never left because uh, my family's just, my entire family's here. You know, uncles, cousins, grandparents, mom, everyone. You were in F- Florida briefly, though, for a little while, right? Yeah, well, I would travel to Florida, and I would say months at a time. That was like our family home vacation. The longest would probably be like two months, probably summer, but I would go yearly. So like I would go there often. So we have a little home, a little place down there. Um, I never worked down there, though. What was it like growing up in Las Vegas? So it's not what people imagine, right? People imagine Vegas, and they think, right, Las Vegas Strip, like when you Google Vegas, that's what you imagine. But when you live on the outskirts, it's pretty normal, actually. And then as you get older, get your own place, you realize Vegas is amazing. It's cheaper. Taxes are lower. You know, it's smaller. You drive from north Las Vegas to the south, and it's maybe 20 to 45 minutes. You know, in L.A., that's like one exit. So, yeah, it was nice. I love Vegas. I've also noticed, too, here is like people – People in Vegas don't want to drive more than like 15 minutes to get anywhere. So, <laughs> like in Atlanta, we would drive, you know, people drive an hour to work easy. Like right. That was considered normal. And here they're like, Oh, you live 20 minutes away? Can't go. I'll just, yeah. <laughs> uh, too far. Uh, yeah, it's too far. I don't know if you notice with the, this with your friends too, but it's like a five mile radius. Like, that's the only circle that they'll go in. It's like the grocery store, my work. Oh, yeah. This is where my, my kids go to school. And like it's just that circle of like Whole Foods and then, and then th- that's, that's it, yeah. their Blo- square. And they're blocked off around that. Or they only go to like that grocery store. Is that, what, is that abnormal like anywhere else? Because you're right. That's super typical here. Like that's normal. I don't know. I just feel like it's in other places that I've lived. I'm like, okay, yeah, 30 minute drive. That's not bad. They like go got... to dinner 30 minutes away. That's fine. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> People don't do that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. People yeah. do not do so that. Like, we can't be friends anymore. Yeah, I'm right. Like, oh, you, okay. you live in Henderson? Yeah. Holy Ooh, crap. That's far. It's the other side of the state. <laughs> <laughs> Unfriend you on Facebook. So, uh, so what do you do for a living? I am a personal trainer. Okay. So how did you get into that? So I got into group fitness. Actually, more specifically, I got into a CrossFit. I started coaching CrossFit in 2012. Um, it's right as I graduated high school, I signed up for the community college here. Um, and then I started, uh, just going to the classes. And I remember specifically, like after the class, there was like no open gym, which means like you were not to work out. And I would stay there and I'd work out. They'd tell me like months at a time, Hey Landon, there's, there's no open gym, man. We've told you like a hundred times. So eventually they're like, you just hire this kid. Like he's not leaving, just hire him. So they hired me to like, you know, front desk, clean the bathrooms. Where was this at? CrossFit Max Effort. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then I want to say like six months in. Um, I went through Zach Forrest's coach's development program, um, and that's when I transitioned into a coach. I probably coached CrossFit and group classes for three to four years, and then I transitioned into personal training just because financially I thought it was a smarter decision. Okay. So how do you go about getting clients? So, I mean, obviously the big deal with being a personal trainer is, like, how do you build your book? So you can go about, like, working for a corporate company, right? It might be a little frowned upon. You go, you know, try to steal clients, but you go, you build relationships with people, right? You meet people. Um, they kind of funnel you clients. That's a great way. I did do that. I worked for Lifetime for a little over a year. Um, and then I broke away, became independent. Social media is a huge thing, right? Just promoting, posting. I might have a buddy that told me, if your posts aren't annoying people, you're not posting enough. When I started doing that, like I was like, yeah, this is obnoxious. I made the same post over and over. Every other post is like a PT post, that's when my clientele kind of, I don't want to say blew up, but like over doubled. 
It really worked, huh? Yeah, it worked. It worked, yeah. Because he said all it takes is that one, that one person that maybe didn't see it, that one person that, like, he, every day he saw it, but then, like, you know, that third week of seeing it, he's like, you know what? I'm in there. I'm going to do it. And then he reaches out to you. So were you posting just, uh, like, was the advertisement, like a posting like an advertisement, or are you just posting just yourself working out? And doing no, stuff, so it was people? everything. It was um, you create content with the clients that you do have, right? Make mm-hmm. sure it's okay with them. And then at the end, you DM me for inquiries, DM me for personal training. Anytime I would make a personal post, right, of me lifting, at the bottom, I would put DM me for personal training. Honestly, it could have been me at dinner with my friends with a photo. And at the bottom, I put DM me for personal training. Like, no matter what, everything had personal training in there. I need, like, people needed to know... Like I'm personal trainer first, right? Everything second, hmm. I guess. That's what that's what I was trying to attack. Yeah. What do you like to do to spend your time in Las Vegas? <laughs> that's a funny question. It's like typical Vegas boy. Um, so I'm not big into sports. I don't. I, I was raised like without a dad, so I was never big into watching sports or anything like that. Um, even playing sports, like I first stopped competing in weightlifting. Like I didn't really like play football. I was never on a league or anything so hang out with my friends you could see the typical hiking thing in vegas honestly it's like way too hot I'm not a big hiking fan so it's more like just hang out with friends honestly it could be anywhere it could be at a bar it could be at a buddy's house like playing video games just surrounding yourself with people that no matter what you're doing you know those people you'll have a good time with them you know so like brunching like brunching happy houring <laughs> of course that's that typical vegas boy stuff <laughs> I didn't realize how big brunch was. That's another thing I've noticed about Vegas is, like, a lot of people seem really into it here. I don't know if it's because, like, the specials in the casinos, but multiple, like, even physical therapists I've worked with, they're like, oh, we're going to go to brunch. Oh, it's, on, it's a on thing. Sunday. They're super excited about it. <laughs> it's a thing. Yeah. What's the best part about brunch besides the bottomless mimosas? Oh, well. <laughs> I guess you could run into happy hour. I don't know. Like, no, <laughs> no, no. I don't know. It's just, um, because brunch is always fun because it's like an event. Like, you usually go to lunch or dinner, right? And it's like, 45 minutes, an hour, if you go with a huge party, 90 minutes. When you go to brunch, like, there's all these places, like, they don't care. They, they expect you to be there, like, two, three hours. You know, you're ordering, like, different, um, not different levels, but you, your appetizers, then you can order, like, your main dishes, then you can order your desserts, mimosas all around. It's just, it's a fun time, you know, with a good amount of people. It's a great time. So, uh, speaking of food, what's your favorite cheat meal? My favorite cheat meal? I don't know. I always, I always want to answer sushi, but I don't know if that's, like, really a cheat meal. I guess I'm not like a big dessert. I love candy, but that's not, I do that every day. That's just a normal power lifter. <laughs> yeah, that's thing. just a normal, that's just normal bodybuilder power lifter. I would have to say sushi. Like when I want to indulge, sushi. That's the thing I've noticed too is there is an absurd amount of sushi places out here. Yeah, I didn't know that all you could eat isn't like a typical thing in a lot of cities. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that. That'd be crazy. Yeah. You asked me why I stay in Vegas right there. That's the reason. Hundred <laughs> percent. All you can eat. All you can eat sushi. Yeah. I'm not going anywhere. That is a big selling point. What is your favorite? Like, do you like just like the sashimi, nigiri? Yeah. Like so I have rolls? my waves. I have my waves. I go in and I start with nigiri. I, when I used to compete, I'd, I'd be around fifty pieces. Now I'll do like twenty. So nigiri, and then I do my uh, hand. No, my rolls, normal rolls. I'm not a big fan of like these fancy cream cheese, like fat boy rolls, just like normal rolls. And then I finish with some hand rolls, spider hand roll, seven skin hand roll. Yeah, spicy scallop hand roll. <laughs> oh, I so, like the strategy there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so when you say you used to compete. Yeah, so I retired. It's so funny when people actually retired because people think I'm so young. But I retired from weightlifting. Oh, my goodness, like five, 15. It was like 2015 or 16, I think, that I retired. Weightlifting, yeah. I just I blew my right knee out. It was like it had to be the 2015 American Open, um, ACL, MCL, meniscus, LCL. Yeah, all like MRI. It's, that's what it showed. All grade twos, luckily. Um, it just it really it took a year till I could like squat normally again. And by that point, I don't. I believe I could never have caught up to the kids that were up and coming. You know, like you take like CJ Cummings and all these kids that are like monsters now. It's interesting when you say retired because. I was taking a sports psychology class like back in I don't know, undergrad, which right. was a long time ago for me. But we talked about it. And it, essentially, everybody who plays any type of sport actually does retire. Right. It doesn't matter what age you are. So say, for example, you played soccer when you're eight years old. Right. And you didn't play ever again. Technically, you, you retired, retired from, from playing soccer because yeah, yeah, you didn't play again. Right. But I, when when they, the professor framed it that way, and I was like, that's actually really true, but also if, if that's something that's like part of your li- daily life, like you're a high school, you know, basketball player, has, like a baseball player in college or wherever that may be, right. technically you're retired and need to prepare yourself 
for that next transition of your life. Right. So it's, it's actually, it's funny when you say that, it's, it's totally true because you're using the, the correct nomenclature because right. you didn't retire from it's, it. It's not something that you do compete. You're not competitively right, doing it again. again. Yeah, it was a pretty crazy transition. Like when all, you're, all you know, like your entire life, well, not your entire life, but all you know for the last six years is wake up, three-hour session in the morning, right? coach a little bit, take a nap, school, right, when I have school, and then three-hour sessions at night. So when you go from, like, putting that much effort into something, and then you're like, man, I'm not doing this anymore. Like, what am I going to, what do I do? So it was, it was a hard transition for me to, like, take the effort that I put into lifting and, I guess, put it towards, like, work. Mm-hmm. It, it took, it took like, two years for me to, like, make that transition. I had, like, a two-year limbo period. I was like, well, now what do I do? <laughs> what a, lot did, of, a lot of sushi and brunch There's a lot of time. sushi and brunch, yeah. <laughs> what did you struggle with in terms of those, like, with that, I, with that transition, I just didn't know how to, I guess, apply that, like, literally apply the effort, like the, like, like as a competitor, as a, right, as an athlete, you, you, you usually have this attack mentality, right? So you gotta be like this giddy, friendly, cool. As a weightlifter, you walk into the gym and it's like, it's a whole. You put a mask on. It's, you know, you're not there to talk. You're not there to make friends. You're, you're there to work. That's your work. That's what you're doing, right? I didn't know how to put that mask on, that attack mask for PT, for finding clients, for, you know, like. I, when I was um, when I was competing, I wouldn't be scared of like, oh, my session's gonna go an hour over. If, if Zach told me like, hey, you had to coach one more class, it was like the end of the world. No, what? I can't coach another class. I already coached four. You know, so mm-hmm. it was like that was a hard, it's a hard transition for me to like just accept like you do what you need to do to get where you need to get. You know, but I think I made it. <laughs> I think I made that transition. When you were weightlifting, so you were doing like six hours a day essentially of training. Oh, yeah. That's when I remember for a short period of time, I lifted with John Bros. And I, I, my sessions were nothing compared to his lifters. His lifters would be there bright and early. Yeah, they would snatch, power snatch, power, or power snatch, power clean. When they do back squat, and then they would take a break and they come back at night after work. It doesn't matter if you had a full time job, you come back at night, and you do the, they do the full lifts, and then you would front squat. And then if you wanted to stay and do auxiliary work, it was, it was crazy. Yeah, six. I think they did it six days a week, too. So it's interesting that you say you had a mask on when you were you were training. Yeah, yeah. Was that I guess was that different than the, your personality as a coach, or is that like? Were no, you... I've I've heard I have the same thing as a coach. Yeah. Like I heard like I don't know like I'm super bubbly, jumpy, and I guess I still coach like that. But I remember when I was interning at Lifetimer, when they were thinking about hiring me, like you could tell the guy was like, oh no, this he's like this guy's a child, like he's a kid, he's not gonna be a good coach. And then he watched me coach, and he just said like my tone of voice changed. He said my voice got deeper. He said, my persona, my, my mannerisms, like everything. He's like, you were a different person. To me, I don't see that because it's, I've done it, I think, for so long. It just happens. Um, but, yeah, it's the same thing now. Like this, that, it, it, the way I used to be with weightlifting, I could be with coaching now. You know, like we could still be friends, but, like, I'm there to make you better. I'm there to, you know. So as far as the clients that you pick up right now, like what is more the ideal client for a few? Like are you looking for weightlifters? Are you looking for people that are just uh, wanting to get fit, going to the, the Aria pool or – <laughs> no, so I guess my <laughs> now my I guess my specialty or like my even my preferred honestly my preferred client is just like the average average male or, or female it doesn't matter I would say definitely definitely thirty plus all the way up until probably like mid forties forty five I have a lot of clients that are fifty um, that want to right look better naked want to improve their quality of life right I would just say that so look better naked improve their quality of life and st- probably stay injury free you know yeah so. I used to attack the whole, like, aesthetics thing, and it just wasn't, um, what's the word? It didn't bring, not, not confidence, it wasn't as, like, made me as excited. I can't think of the word I'm thinking. But, yeah, I didn't get as excited coaching those people. Like, when they hit their goals, like, oh, look, my body fat dropped 2%. And I was like, okay, that's cool. But you show me a guy that comes in and, like, I don't know, like, can't squat to depth, or his knees have been hurting getting off the couch, and now he's over here back squatting. I'm like, yo, that's... That's exciting. Like, that's cool. Mm-hmm. Like, that's what I like to see, you know? And then they get excited, and they're more excited than they're excited. <laughs> yeah. You know, it just builds on each other. And I noticed, too, you take a really good amount of care with your patient or with your uh, clients as well, where you're, uh, like, you're really mindful if they have said they have certain injuries going on or if you notice a, a movement pattern that you that's not quite right, you, you seem to be really good about picking that apart. And then um, if it's something that you're not able to, to deal with, I've seen that you've been able to refer that out pretty well. Right. I guess that originally like came from like Zach Forrest and Lindsay Andrews. They made it very clear that like, hey, it doesn't matter if you piss our, our members off. It doesn't matter if they get a set, right? You need to be relentless. 
They said you need to be relentless with your coaching, right? Because that's what they're paying you to do so they can move healthy, um, so they can make progress and they don't get hurt. Um, and now, like in a group class, it's kind of annoying because you have to stop people. But from a PT aspect, people really appreciate that. You know, they really appreciate that, especially if it goes like your price range. If you're trying to charge like this price range that's up there, like you need to give the people what they're paying for. I'm not going to sit there and like, if someone says, how was that? And you're like, it was okay. And you know in your head, like, oh, that knee's not talking to the toe. You know, in their head, you know, their, sh their shoulders are lifting, they're shrugging up. It doesn't matter, something like that. Like, you need to address it for sure. I think you have an interesting onboarding process with your clients too. You want to tell us a little bit more about what's unique about how you kind of go about with a new person? Yeah, so with the new person, like from the very beginning, like when I first meet them? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I figured, again, put more um, more value to like the to, to not only what they're purchasing, but like to this relationship that you're going to have. Because when you start meeting people you know, five days a week, like you build, you build a relationship, right? So you want to be professional as well. So the first thing I do is I meet my clients. It could be um, at their house. A lot of, most of the time it's at a coffee shop, right? So you meet the clients at a coffee shop. First, you just get to know them. Like you pretty much just ask questions and shut up. How are you? How's your day? What do you do for work? You know, do you have kids? Everything. Just a little background, right? And then even like when they're like, what do you do for work? You know, I work at a computer all day. Then immediately as a coach, you know, like, oh, hip flexors could be super tight. If they work at a computer, I'll shrug forward, right? So all these things add up. They do hire you. So that's a good reason you do that. Um, secondly, I have told clients, like, you know, I, I don't think, like, I'm the correct match for you as a trainer, um, but I could refer you to someone else, you know? And that's like someone comes in and they're like, I want to do a show. Now it's to the point where I'm like, yeah, I'm sorry, that's just not, that's not what I coach people for. Um, so we go about that. If we figure out that we're, we are the right fit for each other, um, we do one session. Um, after the one session, I say, like, hey, what do you think about it? We talk, and then we start talking about the packages. You also do some people, you send people out to get blood work too, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I yeah. make all my clients, um, I just started training females again, because usually with males, I don't know too much about female hormones, but males, I make all my clients go do um, a full blood panel. Um, the main reason for that, um, obviously, you could even see cortisol. That's huge in there, right? People overworking, under, under eating, under sleeping. But even bigger than that for me is if I see a male with, like, low T, like, under 3, I mean, like, 200, middle-aged man, 200, there's not too much I could, honestly, I could do for him. I can improve his quality of life. I can make him feel better, right? I could fix his movement. Cool. I could fix his posture during the day, and it translates to when he's working. But when it comes to, like, putting on muscle, if you have that low T, like, it's... It's going to be really hard. So I want to make sure people don't hire me, right? They pay me a certain amount that you expect to get something out of it, and then I can't, I can't give them what they paid for, you know? So I try to get all the guessing to go away, like no guessing. And do you do any kind of uh, remote or online coaching if people are interested in something like that? So I do remote and online coaching, but now I don't pick up new clients with remote and online coaching. So um, this, the transition is, right, you can hire me as a personal trainer, I fix your movement. Okay, cool. Now the other options are you could transition to online or remote coaching. And I program for you. Now I already know you move safely and properly. You can't hurt yourself. Cool. Or you can transition into group classes. So I, I started doing group classes. It's three to six people, but I don't pick up new clients for group classes. It's too hard to like zone in on one person and not ignore others, right? So if you're a new, a new athlete of mine, I won't put you in a group class. You have to go through a couple PT sessions, even if it's just a month. Yeah. As far as uh, any kind of, uh, like, if they ask you for a nutrition plan or a meal plan or anything like that, yeah, how so do you approach that? I'm not a registered dietitian, but I am a nutritionist. So as a nutritionist, I can't prescribe diets, right, but I could refer. So um, I give people what I do personally is I give people an example meal plan. So it's like, hey, your breakfast could look like this, or your lunch could look like this, your dinner could look like this. Um, each macro has a, a color. Let's say blue for carbs, red for protein, and yellows for fats, and then on the side, it has a bunch of acceptable macros. So then they know, hey, if I don't want to eat this red macro or this red protein, I could just trade it for this red protein. You know, so they're kind of doing it themselves. Yeah, and I have kind of been on this, um, it's called a FODMAP diet. It's this whole anti, it's like an anti-inflammatory diet. It takes out all phytic acid, gluten, very low sh sugar. It actually takes out dairy, right? Dairy is a huge inflammatory for most people. Um, and even if people think they're not sensitive to those things, I still take them out. And then we could incorporate them back in there, right? So if someone says they can't eat dairy, or they can't eat dairy I take it out. We put it back in, you know, stomach hurts, have gas. You know, hey, maybe you shouldn't be eating that. So everything, at least for diet, is 100% trial and error, you know? As you've been doing that, so you, do you take people out of that? And then as you reintroduce that stuff, do you notice, like, people feeling differently with, you know, whatever that they were previously eating? Or yeah, the biggest thing I notice is actually weight. The amount of weight that they lose in that first week to two weeks is a lot, and it's literally just inflammation. 
It's pretty crazy. Like, you take out dairy, people usually lose a lot of weight. I do have a few clients that have dairy and they have no problem. But uh, usually the first two weeks, the majority of my clients see it, see it change. And then if they don't see a change and we put them back in and they still don't see a change, personally, that's like when I question, like, are you actually doing it or are you lying? So, yeah, yeah. But most people do. They do see a change when you take out those things. What is something that you've learned and you wish you knew sooner? Oh, my goodness. Something I've learned and I wish I knew sooner. I mean, I could attack that, like, coming from, like, a movement standpoint. Oh, my God, I can get, like, so specific with that. I can talk about, like, nutrition. Let's talk about a nutrition one. A nutrition one? Yeah, so if I were to talk about nutrition, I would say, like, I wish, I honestly, okay, I wish I knew about, like, nutrition timing before. I wish I knew that, like, I, I still bl- refuse to believe that a calorie, people, you know, as people say a calorie is a calorie. As I totally disagree with that. Um, but you talk about nutrition timing, right? So let's talk about that. This is something that a lot of nutritionists, I wouldn't even say, like, a lot of di- dietitians don't even talk about. So nutrition timing, you talk about, right, most bodybuilders, even CrossFitters, as soon as they're done with the workout, they what? They the protein shake, right? Cool. You drink that protein shake, you're supposed to what? supposed to help you rebuild your muscle, right? If your glycogen is completely depleted, which it should be if you went through a good workout, right, and you're getting no insulin response, the protein shake isn't going to do much of anything. Right, you need to replenish your glycogen. Once your glycogen is replenished, your body's like, oh, okay, you don't look hypoglycemic anymore. Awesome, great. You, you get a little more energy in there. Your body will use the glucose. It will spike your insulin. The insulin is king of, of being anabolic. Right? It's the most. It's, I think it might be the most anabolic thing you can put in your body. Don't quote me on that. But I think so. That's when the protein synthesis occurs, when you have that spike. So, like that protein shake that people drink after. Sometimes it has a little sugar and a little carbs, but. There's a reason you see bodybuilders eating gummy bears when they're done working out. It's, yeah, you think it's a joke, but I'm telling you, there's a reason. There's a reason those guys are so big, you know? Well, who makes the best gummy bear? Oh, is it Harbing? Harb? Is that the one? Yeah, Harbing? I don't even know how to pronounce it. Harbingo? Har- those German ones? Harbingo? Harbingo. Har- I think it's Haribo, right? Oh, yeah. Family size? No, I eat that one sitting. <laughs> yeah. 100%. 100%. Like you're eating chips? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So as far as uh, something that you wish you knew sooner, how about that as applied to maybe movement patterns or, or training or cues? Yeah, movement patterns, I was really lucky to meet this guy at Lifetime. His name was Chris Nordine. He's huge with the uh, Strong First community. And just, um, yeah, just with movement patterns, people are too, just too, too loose with their coaching with movement pattern. Like, they're like, oh, that'll do. You know, or, oh, that's okay, or, oh, that's the best they could do. But you don't know what's the best you could do because you didn't even try cueing it or fixing it. You know, so I think it just comes back to, like, being relentless. Like, I, I didn't start being relentless until I was, like, started PT, which what I said was, like, 15, right, 12, 13, 13, 14 or 15. So, I, like, I wish I was this relentless and I was this open to continue education and, like, just just absorbing knowledge when I, when I started CrossFit, like, in 2013. I feel like I would be even a better coach. Yeah. What about something you've learned in just your life in general, like personal life or, you know, something that you're like, yeah, I wish I learned that sooner. Personal life? Well, I'd say personal life slash work is like never get comfortable for sure. Now you can apply that to both, but more so as work, right? Like let's say you build this clientele. Like I said before the uh, pandemic or right, the shutdown, I was up to 14 clients. You have your 14, so what naturally what you stop doing, you stop posting. You stop finding new clients, right? Most clients can't sustain this price, so then they fall off. Next thing you know, you have four, but you don't have, like, that that funnel of people waiting that were waiting for an opening. So now you're sitting there for – and it takes time to find clients. So now you're sitting for, whatever, two to three months with four clients. You're like, oh. <laughs> you know? So, yeah, getting comfortable. Getting comfortable, yeah, is um, probably a, a huge thing that I learned to not do. It's something you mentioned with your continuing education. Is there uh, something that you've been you know, kind of leaning towards for things that you've been enjoying reading or listening to? Or So you know? lately, I don't know. Lately, I've been 100% like full steam ahead on just Pavel Strong First stuff. So he, I know he has in Las Vegas coming up, actually, I think it's next month, he has a barbell certification, oh. which I would love to do. And most people would be like, why are you going to do that? Why are you going to do the barbell certification? Right? You're, you're, that's like your you're bread and butter. Yeah, you, know, you could always learn more. I would love to see what he has to say, right? Um, he's big into kettlebells. Um, he also has a bodyweight certification course. 
Um, the stuff I love, the thing I love about Pavel, which uh, CrossFit doesn't do, is like range of motion standards are the same for everyone unless you have an injury. So like if he tells you, hey, lock your arm out, and you say, I can't, my bicep's too tight, he'll fail you, right? CrossFit will be like, oh, this is just your range. This is it. So this is your lockout, right? Pavel will say, no, go mobilize, right? In three months, come back, retest. And then if you pass, I'll, lock, I'll give you your certification. So I, that I love. That's huge. So as the barbell one, do you have to go and physically? Oh yeah, they have like tests. Yeah, tests. I don't know what the test is for the barbell, but you do like um similar to CrossFit. You, you break up in groups. You practice coaching. You practice cueing. But then personally, as a coach, you need to be able to perform the exercises. Mm-hmm. You can't just go in there and say like, "Hey, I'm a great coach, but watch me not be able to do these." Mm-hmm. You know, the load doesn't matter. Um, and and that one in the in the barbell. There's other ones that the load matters. And the barbell certification, I believe the load doesn't matter, but you have to perform the exercises. Oh, okay. Yeah, and I think his stuff is like pass fail you're saying i heard that it's like better luck next time and then oh yeah the next one like they have like strict standards on uh, very strict it's not like oh that was close enough no 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 (laughs) no no yeah i've never been to one of their courses but i hear good things yes yeah Yeah, great for the kettlebell ones they have specific standards for women and male like they have the beast tamer which is like the pull a weighted chin up for the well excuse me way to pull it for the girls and pull for the guys Weighted pistol for the girls, weighted pistol for the guys, and the press, single arm kettlebell press. Like the girls have to hit. And it's not, it doesn't, body weight doesn't matter. Like you have to hit these numbers. It doesn't matter if you weigh this, it doesn't matter if you weigh that. Yeah. And I think it's, uh, I want to say it's like, is it a pood for, yeah. for women? Oh, for girls, I don't know. For guys, you have the pistol, I think the 88, which is insane. That's the, that's why it's called, oh, that's why it's called the beast hammer. That makes sense. Because it's the 88, it's called the beast. Um, mm-hmm. The pull up, it's up there. It's more than a two pood. Actually, you know, I think it's called the beast tamer for guys because you have to do everything with the 88. Oh, nice. That should make sense. You have to do a chest bar pull-up with the 88. You have to be able to press it, right? And it's crazy. When you press it, there could be, there's supposed to be no movement of the spine. If there's any movement, you'll fail. It's pretty insane. You have to be locked in there. Have you taken any of these courses yet, or this is your first one? I haven't done the beast tamer or any of those, no. Just read his books, everything mm-hmm. like that. This will be my first, the barbell one, which is exciting. I would love to do just the SFG one, but I want to get a hang of this one first because the SFG one is like, is one of like his like cert- it's not a course it's a certification, the barbell is a course, so like if you have an SFG one like, you could put on, like next to your name as per- personal trainer SFG one personal trainer SFG two I think it goes all the way up into SFG three which I believe there's only two in Vegas. What is that uh, SFG? Strong first. I don't know what the G stands for. Yeah, I think you have to recertify for that one too. It's like I don't want to say it's like a yearly, a yearly a recertification yearly where you have oh, to the basically SFGs? Keep, you have to keep it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. every year you retest it. So whatever you is did, it yearly? Something like it's that. It's something because my yeah. buddy retested and he failed the snatch test because oh. he had no lungs. He couldn't breathe. Oh, <laughs> he couldn't no. breathe. Yeah, it's crazy. So what do they do then? Like do they yank your number, your letters, and then you have to come back and get them. You have a certain period of time that you could record yourself and send it back in if you only failed one portion. Oh, so wow. if he only failed the snatch portion, I think he had a month to send in a video of him doing the snatch portion, and then it would be okay. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Pretty cool. So what is your approach to programming for your clients? Um, so I have two approaches. I either program through movement pattern. So usually the first thing is all based on like how many days a week you have to work out. So like let's go. I mean, we could start anywhere. If you have two days to work out, it would be day A, upper body, horizontal push, horizontal pull, and you could say hinge. Day two, day B would be vertical push, vertical pull, squat, right? And then in a more perfect world, you could break those up. So if you say from two days to four days, you would go one day is hinge, day two is horizontal push, horizontal pull, day three is squat, day four is vertical push, vertical pull, you know? And then you could always just break it up more. And then what you do when you break it up is you just put more volume in, right? So like an ideal world, like two is not enough. You'd, you'd probably only do like three to four sets of work you know, if you have to warm up for a hinge and a vertical push, vertical pull. But, or I, I do the classic bodybuilding split, which in my opinion is the most efficient way to change your aesthetics. It's, that's one thing that bodybuilders had down. So it'd be like the whole Monday chest. You had all three angles, right? Incline, flat, decline. You could Tuesday, right? Lower body posterior, so hamstrings and butt. Wednesday, back, which would be horizontal pull, vertical pull. Thursday, shoulders. Friday, lower body, anterior, so it's mostly just quads. You know, and that's it's just because the amount of volume that you could put in attacking one muscle group, if you're eating enough, like your body will, it will change. Yeah. Did you do a lot of bodybuilding in the past? Or I, have you dabbled in? 
I did. I never competed. I I, didn't, I was never big into the competing and that is the whole flexing and people judging your body. I just did the bodybuilding until I was happy with my aesthetics, and then I went right back to strength training. <laughs> I was like, okay. And then the funny thing is, once my aesthetics were like what I liked, once I started strength training, it didn't change much. Like my, it's not like I had to continue doing bodybuilding. No. How long did you do that? The bodybuilding. Mm-hmm. Oh no, I, I started getting into it because it's like good auxiliary work for weightlifting. So 2014. I probably stopped at seven, so it was probably two and a half years that I was, like, really into that, into it. I put, like, a good amount of muscle in my body, and I was, like, content with it. Yeah. Have you had any injuries throughout your career? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that we talked about that right knee injury. I just tore my left bicep completely off. <laughs> um, let me see. I broke both my wrists at the same time, trying to clean 200 kilos for the first time. Um, actually, that might be it. Yeah, that, that is it, actually. It's not too many. I've, I've seen worse. <laughs> when was the bicep injury? That was fairly recent, right? It was, yeah, six six weeks ago. Yeah. Thanks to Dr. Lou, it was pretty good. Hmm. What is something you've been working on professionally, personally, physically, or mentally that you are excited about? Professionally? Personally. Anything. It could be any of those any of those categories. So, I mean, I guess in the past, my biggest thing to attack was, like, I wanted to open up my own gym. Like, I got to the point where, like, I was, like, actually, like, with a realtor looking. And then I kind of realized, like, I don't know if that's what I want to do. Yeah, so I don't, I don't know. It's, it's, I guess the thing that I always attack is just, like, it seems so very repetitive. But literally just continue, like, literally just continue education. Like, absorbing as much knowledge that a personal trainer could absorb, you know. I, like, at the end of the day, it would be cool, like, like, let's say you go back to school to, like, do what you guys do. Become an actual PT because now you can, what's the word, you can uh, prescribe or you could, um, diagnose right that'd be super cool because a personal trainer you can't do that you could help people and then if i don't can't help them then i push them to like people like you and stuff like that but imagine being the person that like did it all that'd be pretty cool yeah <laughs> so speaking of continuing education i've seen uh, you've read some poker books around <laughs> yeah yeah so i started playing poker oh my goodness in when i got engaged or i was engaged this 12 i think i want to say 2014 i started playing cards um <laughs> yeah, the first year, yeah, I mean, I probably lost like $20,000 because I had no idea what I was doing. Those books are expensive, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no I, Well, I actually just now finally started reading books and getting into the education. So I would say I wasn't playing poker when I started. I was saying I, I was gambling. I had no idea what I was doing. Like, I would go to put the chips on the table. My hands would be shaking. I was so nervous. Yeah, but, um, yeah, I, I started reading um, poker books. Um, I'm definitely not a mathematician or wizard, but the game's a lot easier than what people think. And it, it was definitely... a form of supplemental income um for the last two years i would say which is nice so what advice would you give to uh future parker players out there study more than you play (laughs) that's the best that's the best thing you could ever do make sure you are you have more study hours than you have playing hours because if you don't you're not ever going to be as good as you could be yeah does, if you're playing like online poker or playing just the games that people play online, like does that teach you anything about it really, or is that just more? Yeah, the the, the good beneficial thing to playing online, well, if it's with real cash, is that every hand is recorded, so you could go back and look at all your hand histories and like see like, oh wow, like this was a mistake, because that's what you that's what a lot of poker is. So if I'm at the table and you know, I lose a hand, I don't really understand why. I back away from the table, I grab my notebook, and I ran I write down the hand analysis. So then I can go back there and right after later and look at it and see like where where did I mess up? Where did I make the mistake? All right? Because that's that's all it is. Like poker is very it's very written. Like in this scenario, you you do this, and this scenario you're supposed to do this. But what happens is your emotions get in the way, right? Or Maybe there's this point where you don't know what you're supposed to do, but then you go back, you look at the hand analysis, you open your notebooks, you study your notebooks, you're like, okay, this is where I messed up. You know, I shouldn't even have been in this hand. I should have three bet in this position, whatever. So what made you ever get interested in poker? Just living in Vegas? Or was it that you had some friends that got you into it? My ex fiance was engaged to Antonio Estefandiari's brother, which if you don't know who Antonio Estefandiari is, is, I mean... I would still say he's one of the greatest poker players in the entire world. So he's the magician, yeah. yeah. Very, I mean, the highest, one of the highest grossing, like, poker players ever. Hmm. Yeah, so she was, in, she was dating, at, like, and she was dating his brother, and then his brother got her into poker. So then my ex-fiance got me into poker. 
Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I, I've actually played or ever gone to a poker table. So what's the etiquette? If you're at a poker table, what's what's something that if you're like a brand new person, like mm, never, what you do not never do? do? Yeah. yeah. Act act out of position. People get really mad when you do that. So it's supposed like, okay, it's on me, I fold, it's on Joe, he folds. I say I fold, and then Joe's looking at his cards and then you just fold. Oh, so I put it. I, it, I skip bef- his turn. You skip his turn. People get really mad because that could change the whole the whole name of the game. Because now, let's say there could have been four people in the hand. You fold, and now there's only gonna be three people in the hand. Maybe Joe's hand is acceptable to play with three handed, but not acceptable to play four handed. So now he's gonna play. You gave him an advantage. So basically, <laughs> that so whatever card that I had, I had two cards potentially. Now that he has a better chance to look at those in in terms of like the play of the overall. Yeah. So determining how many people are at the table determines how many, like w- what what range of cards you play. So like if there's less people at the table, your range usually increases. Meaning if you folded ahead, right? There's less people at the table. That means his range increased. So maybe he was going to fold that hand, but now, because his range increased, maybe that those cards are in his new range, and now he's going to play it. Yeah, so you pretty much like gave him a free hand. Yeah. Is, is there anything else that people do like or really should free. should know that you, at a poker table? No, no. <laughs> no, not really. Besides that, like, that's the, I mean, obviously, don't try to look at some people's cards. They get really mad if you do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess, uh, oh, what's that called? If you... It's not side betting. It's uh, you, if you go to act act like you're gonna bet, right? You cross the line, but you never let go of the chips. Uh-huh. You know, you do this, and then somebody next to you thinks you dropped your chips, so then they bet. You could actually pull them back. So it's like you you like tricked him. Oh, you like faked him out. Yeah, in a sense? yeah. And people do like in Vegas. Luckily, people a lot of people don't do that. I heard like at the buy school, like in L.A., people would do that all the time. Yeah. Just to check if people are paying attention, or just to mess with people. Yeah, yeah. Because like let's say. You were going to make it 15, and, and this guy thinks you dropped the 15, so this guy raised to 45 before you dropped your 15, right? So he three bet you. Then you could be like, oh, I know he has a good hand. Oh, okay, I just fold, you know? Mm. So it, he's like, oh, oh man. So, so what would you do about those? So if, if people aren't paying attention as much, are people paying it as much attention as you like generally think about because i see people all like go, going in those card rooms and they're like getting massages and they all have like headphones on and they're like they yeah. don't really and some of them are like on their phone so like how does like how do you like i guess a good amount of people i mean especially in this city are good enough to like be like be on their phone be on their computer and do all that the majority of people don't pay attention they're literally just not paying attention. Yeah, they're low, they don't want unless they're in the hand, they're not paying attention. And you're supposed to watch every single hand, whether you're in the hand or not. You see like what people are betting, what cards if they show their cards, like what cards are they playing, what positions. Yeah. Well, we really appreciate you coming on here. Is there anything? Uh, where can people find you about that? Um, so I mean, you can find me on uh, my Instagram. It's actually just my name, Landon DeCastroverde. So L A N D O N. D E C A S T R O V E R D. That's a long one. <laughs> yeah, you can people reach out to me. Um, yeah, for personal training, like I said, any inquiries, anything like that. And what would be something you'd like to leave listeners with? Last question. So, oh, that's that's deep now. Something. The last question is the hardest. Something I'd like to leave listeners with. Yeah, I wouldn't uh, leave listeners with regarding personal training or regarding personal anything training. Surprise us. Anything could be oh, co- so could be cooking. Too. Eat gummy uh, bears after you work out. Yeah. I don't no, know. So, uh, let's let's talk about if like if you're talking about personal training. Let's say someone's looking for a personal trainer, mm-hmm. right? I would say do like do your research. Like do your research and don't don't um, feel obligated or don't feel like that you can't reach out to like a current client of his and like and like ask you know because I've seen personal trainers like r- like really hurt clients, like really injure their clients. So like if you're looking for a personal trainer, do your research, look around. Um, and honestly, like, don't let price scare you. You should be looking at more than that. That's why you should be doing your research. Solid advice. We appreciate it, sir. Thanks again for being yeah, on our show. Thanks for having me. Thank mm-hmm. you, Andy. We'd like to thank you for listening to La Vida Las Vegas podcast. We hope you enjoyed the time with our guests as much as we did. It would help us out so much if you could share, subscribe, or review our podcast or any combination of the three. Thanks again, and remember to take care of yourself. 